What's going on, people? We are live for another retro review like we did the previous week uh, over with Monday Night Raw from August 25th, 2003. And now we're going to do August 28th iteration of Thursday Night Smackdown. Yes, Smackdown was on a Thursday. Then it was on a Wednesday. Then they moved to a Tuesday. Then they were back to a Thursday. Then they pushed to Friday. I think that was around 2006 or 2007. Whatever. Smackdown had to change every time whenever they were in a television slot. If you remember them on uh, a CW or Fox. Now they're back on Fox after spending like near a decade of uh, what sci-fi and then they were in USA for the uh, for Smackdown Live. Smackdown was actually watchable around 03, garnering a rating of a 3.1 on their episode of Smackdown after SummerSlam, ending with Eddie Guerrero becoming uh, still your United States champion. He went up before, I think, around Vengeance for the first time around 2002 when they were doing a tournament to cover the United States title on SmackDown because the European title was vacant over a unification with the IC title. Or I think it was with the Hardcore title, whatever. So, we were in El Paso. So you tell me how hot the crowd was for being in, you know, where Eddie grew, grew up in, bringing up his family... With all the racial stereotypes, John Cena coming in, making more racial stereotypes, making a wet back reference. You can't see that shit on TV anymore. Yo, see, uh, if, if you go back to just how just non-politically correct WWE was back in the day, even around the Ruthless Aggression era when they were trying to slightly small in their demographic uh, to a more younger audience... It was still adult jokes, still adult humor, still adult themes to try to make sure it garners more of the impact when it comes to a major storyline or a feud. Bro, they just did not care. And I love every moment of it. I'm sorry. I don't care if it's nostalgia talking. It's for real. Eddie Guerrero opening over the show on SmackDown with a belt. Fans completely red hot him coming over the crowd with a low rider. And then John Cena... Trying to make as many racial slur bars as possible. And it ended up with a challenge for the U.S. title. That was the way we had to uh, nearly close off the show. But we still had like a lot of shit happening. Of course, the feud with Kurt Angle and Brock Lesnar. And, uh, yeah, we're going to go into all of that. So we opened the show after like a 10-minute segment involving Eddie Guerrero and John Cena. We had Rey Mysterio facing off against... Nunzio from FBI for the Cruiserweight title. You know, it was a fairly energetic, fast-paced match, as it is for any Cruiserweight match. It uh, We had Hurricane Rana's counters over with DDTs, uh, Inziguri, Rey Mysterio coming over to the 619, greatly selled by Nunzio, flipping like a flapjack. As soon as I showed my little brother, uh, bro, he loved it. But there was a counter from the top rope of a powerbomb. A lot more chains uh, ensued, and usually the uh, FBI would actually be around the corner with Nunzio, but they were banned from ringside before the match even started. Ending with a, a ending with a roll down off a pin off Rey Mysterio retaining the cruiserweight title in a good opener. Chris Benoit versus A Train happened later on. Better match than they had, I think, at SummerSlam, and I think they also had a match later on in No Mercy. Dude, th this... Oh, wow. And I had to tell you, if you watch 03 SmackDown, people think 2016 was the MVP. Dude, there, you had to watch SmackDown back in the day to actually know SmackDown was actually watchable. And I think 03 was the best year of the Ruthless Aggression era next to 2005. And probably, out of nostalgia purposes, people would say 06 or 08. Even though 08 kind of transitioned to the PG era, first half of 08 was pretty entertaining. So, yeah. Average clothesline. There was like a massive chain of German suplexes. Diving headbutt near fall. Uh, advantage over the exposed turnbuckle. It ends with a double choke slam. Near fall. Benoit caught. He caught A Train into the. I think a roll up after the cross face failed. But his feet were on the rope after I think uh, the submission. But the ref didn't pay attention on it. And it pick up to 
A train venting his frustrations to Benoit backstage, and then a gore out of nowhere that caught me completely off guard. And I forgot Benoit was also feuding with uh, Rhino. I think they also tagged before on SmackDown, so I don't know. I don't care. It was a cool way for a jumping, so I guess this is going to be the constant rivalry. That's what I remember Benoit was doing in Rhino 3, other than chasing Kurt Angle for the WWE title back in the day. So that was it before, you know, the rest is history. At 04, and then 07 when he killed his family in itself. But uh, <clears throat> besides that, later on backstage, there would also be a promo. Uh, backstage, there would be Eddie Guerrero uh, trying to sit up backstage for his a match against John Cena later on. That some guy that somehow Latino, I guess he knows Eddie Guerrero because he's Latino, comes around saying, Man, somebody messing with your ride, Holmes. Yeah. <laughs> like, they try so hard to find the most generic Latino, bro. Like, I know a lot of Latinas and Latinos, and you're telling me they have to always sound like that? I don't know. I don't know, dog. Well, it got messed up anyway. Everybody on the SmackDown locker room was watching that uh, Eddie Guerrero's uh, wheel literally was missing off his car. And then later on, John Cena, that caused a little scuffle with Eddie Guerrero early around the show. Would he be the reason why his ride would be missing? And then he tried to blame it on it. Oh, he got enemies because he lied, cheat, and steal. I mean, at least it makes a sort of amount of sense. But they didn't continue with this later on because it would be too obvious that it would be John Cena. Literally coming out for the U.S. title match. Literally with a wheel. We also had a promo involving Brock Lesnar. Saying that it was a fluke that he would even tap out to Kurt Angle back at SummerSlam. And of course, we get the, you know, we always get those promos. Like, everybody's coming into the ring. And then, of course, they mock, mock that you tap out like it's your first time ever. It was for Brock because he was a dominant figure until later on. And then he's like, Undertaker came out saying that he's seven foot tall, 500 pounds. Like, he's been saying the same promo for nearly like. Most of the time that he's been there in the WWE. And of course Undertaker's like my yard. At least they have a smidget of star power. It gets exciting for Kurt Angle. Of course mocking around and calling Brock Lesnar a bitch. Saying that he's a whiner. And I would be in your position too. If I wasn't the WWE champion. <laughs> Literally entertaining whenever Brock and Kurt are always sharing the mic dude. One of the best feuds You'll ever see in WWE if you guys want to go back and, you know, relive your childhood. Go back and watch 03 SmackDown if you remember the rivalry with Kurt Angle and Brock Lesnar around that time. I'm shocked they don't try to reference it when uh, Kurt Angle was GM at the time and Lesnar was Universal Champion. So I don't, I'm shocked they don't reference it that often. When these guys were feuding for the world title for a majority of their career. Especially for Brock's because uh, he left around 04. And Kurt was there for another couple of years until he moved to TNA. So, Stephanie came over. Mocking around Kurt tapping, uh, Brock tapping out again. Then issuing a triple threat match for the main event on SmackDown. To face Kurt Angle for the WWE title next week on SmackDown. So, it'll be Undertaker and Big Show and, Kurt, and Brock to see who will face Kurt. And that would be our main event. We also had Eddie Guerrero. We go, this match was violent for the US title. Oh, I forgot, like, Sable was managing A-Train at the time. Didn't think it was important, but, uh... Yeah, it was a 15-minute uh, bout. Ending with uh, Eddie winning over DQ after Cena thought he couldn't beat him with the FU. With the chain. Busted open. Eddie was, whole, like, completely ballistic. Pummeling over John Cena. Hitting him with Lucha Libre moves while pummeling him. Or just overpowering him as well with clotheslines. Three amigos nearly had Cena countered into a roll up. Still couldn't get him down. Cena couldn't even outsmart his way out for the victory. Ending it, uh, ending it with low blowing Eddie, hitting him with, with a chain to the forehead, busting him open. Then, of course, if you any of you guys ever seen a highlight of any WWE moves, it ended with him getting fu'd on the wheel of his low rider. One of the most memorable parts of uh, SmackDown. And, uh, yeah, ending up with some major heat. I think they also had a street fight up, uh, they had a lot of, that they had a parking lot street fight match, I think, on the next week or two weeks later on SmackDown. So, if y'all want, I can review that, too. That's actually a memorable moment. I love that episode. 
And I try to watch it with family, dude. Like, when I tell you, like, there used to be a bunch of wrestling fans, especially my cousins. I know people that used to like wrestling. Undertaker, Lesnar, and Big Show in the triple threat match to face off against Kurt Angle for the WWE title uh, was at least the second longest match of the night, ending in 16, while the U.S. title match ended in DQ from 15. And, uh, yeah, the, four matches, and it was still an entertaining show. We had, like, a double clothesline, hit over with the steel steps, Big Show was, like, hit with a chair several times over to the outside. There was a, oh my god, a double suplex over with the Big Show. Nearly about to cause an implode of the ring before it ended just with a power bomb. Lesnar just regularly, just vertically suplexed the Big Show out of nowhere, dog. I don't know how the hell that happened, but that was an insane spot. After the F5, Big Show kicked uh, him out the way. But after Big Show later on choked, uh, choke slammed Kurt Angle, last ride on Lesnar. Uh, I mean, last ride on Lesnar. After a Big Show got Lesnar, uh, Big uh, Undertaker got Big Show out the way over the top rope, ending him to lose his balance to get out the ring, ending with a last ride in winning the match. Undertaker will face Kurt Angle on SmackDown soon. For the WWE title. And we end our show. Pretty basic. We still have some preceding storylines. I just love the rivalries back in the day. The atmosphere was good. Michael Cole and Taz were just on point. Except with their sombrero. And just dumbass takes. Taz being entertaining but retarded. And Michael Cole actually being. Oh my god. I can actually listen to Michael Cole. But uh. You know, this was a pretty alright show. I'll give it a 7 out of 10. It wasn't the greatest SmackDown to watch, but you guys want to relive childhood? Uh, think about watching it. Uh, I don't, I don't want to risk a, a website being banned so we don't get to watch it. So I, I sadly don't want to link it for the cost of that. So that's it for me. Hope you guys like this retro review. I guess we'll be back to regular reviews around next week where I have a lot more time in my hands. And uh, I'm going to enjoy my spring break and also enjoying that Series S that hopefully comes around the weekend. That's it for me. Thanks for watching the DST Show.